everyone! Today I wanted to share with you a chapter from a new book by Shakira Bourne called Josephine Against the Sea. I love this story because our main character is fearless and fun-loving and she goes on this magical, heartfelt adventure that also incorporates elements of Caribbean mythology. 11-year-old Josephine knows that no one is good enough for her daddy. That's why she's desperate to make it onto her school's cricket team. She'll get to play her favorite sport and make sure her fisherman daddy is too busy attending her matches to date. But when tryouts go badly, the frustrated Josephine makes a wish on a powerful silk cotton tree and accidentally introduces a bigger problem into her life. The next day, daddy brings home a new catch, a beautiful woman named Maurice. And unlike his other girlfriends, she doesn't scare easily. Josephine knows there's something fishy about Maurice. She sings in a strange language, eats weird food, and seems to exert mysterious control over everyone she meets. Josephine knows that Maurice isn't what she seems. She might not even be human. But who's going to believe her? Can Josephine convince her friends to help her? and use your cricket skills to save daddy from Maurice before it's too late. So here's chapter one of Josephine Against the Sea by Shakira Bourne. It's 4.58 p.m. and daddy still isn't back from his date. I should have never allowed him to leave home. He's been gone for two whole hours. Two hours we could have spent watching the cricket match on TV, but no, he had to go out and have ice cream with a friend. We have good cherry vanilla ice cream right here in the freezer. He could have eaten that with me. With my binoculars, I see Jalopy, his old white Jeep, coming from at least two minutes away. I yank the binoculars away from my face and glance at the old brass clock. 4.59 p.m. He promised to be back by five. He's officially going to be late. I peer through the binoculars again and notice a woman with big curly hair in the passenger seat and he's not alone. I growl under my breath and prepare to defend my territory. Across the street, I notice Akai, my neighbor and best friend, taking out the garbage. His face is almost as sour as mine. I can guess what's in that bag. It's Saturday, which means his mother has made steamed flying fish and cornmeal cuckoo for his entire family. That's when an idea hits me. Operation Slime. I'm going to make sure that friend gets a small taste of life with a fisherman like my daddy. I do my evil laugh. It starts with a low chuckle and climbs into a roaring cackle. Akai looks up at my window, shakes his head, and hurries back inside. He knows what's coming. I scramble to message him from my walkie-talkie under the bed. Come in, Akai. Over. I let go of the button and wait. Just static. The old brass clock ticks. Akai, you better answer me. Over. Silence. All right, I forgot Akai insists on using code names. Come in, Alpha Mike. Over. Static, and then, this is Alpha Mike. Alpha Mike. Alpha Mike. I wait for Akai to finish whispering his code name exactly five times. That's just how he is. He's on the, what's it called again? It reminds me of something wonderful. Awesome rhythm. Autism, that's it. He's on the autism spectrum, and I'm one of the few people Akai utters a word to. People think he's odd, but I don't mind. He's my best friend in the whole world. Actually, he's my only friend in the whole world, which is fine by me. Alpha Mike, retrieve the stinky garbage and bring it to my location. Over. I waste precious seconds trying to persuade Akai to hide in the hibiscus bushes. I don't know why he bothers to protest. He never turns his back on a mission. Though the bush is about four feet high, it completely covers his short, slight frame. He's dressed the part of a good lookout, wearing a dark green shirt and black jeans. I push a red hibiscus flower into the black knitted tam on his head to make sure he's fully camouflaged. Then I hear a jackhammer rattling in the distance. That's jalopy coughing its way home. I really didn't need binoculars. I can hear that engine coming from a mile away. I rush inside to get into position at the top of the stairs. Soon, Akai chimes in on the walkie-talkie. The target has left the rickety vehicle. She is approaching the red hibiscus bush and ascending the stairs. 
She will reach your location in approximately 10.3 seconds. 9.6 seconds. 8. I put the walkie-talkie on the floor and pick up my battered cricket ball. Since the incident, I'm not allowed near Coach Brooms' equipment room, so I'm forced to hunt for rejected cricket balls like some kind of cow leather scavenger. I had fished this one out of the bushes when Jared, the best cricket player at my school, hit it for six. Almost all the thread is gone and I get a little bounce when it hits the grass. But I don't need bounce now. I need precision. The bucket of slime on top of the fridge has to tip at just the right angle. I grip the cricket ball between two fingers for a straight throw. I've heard people on TV compare cricket to baseball because both sports use bats, but cricket is far superior. For one thing, cricket balls are much harder and heavier, which will come in handy to move the full bucket. Focus, precision, speed. Every good bowler knows the best type of delivery to hit the target. And unfortunately for Daddy's date, I'm the best bowler in the village. The back door opens and I know my daddy, the gentleman that he is, will let his friend inside the house first. I am overwhelmed by the smell of fruity, cheap perfume. Now! I release the ball and watch as it speeds toward the target. Yes! Yes! No! The ball misses the rim of the bucket by a whisper. I hope that its wind is enough to make the bucket lose balance from the edge of the refrigerator, but it's not my lucky day. Instead, the ball continues across the kitchen and crashes through the window. The glass shatters. Daddy State screams and tries to duck, but she's wobbly on her six-inch heels. Daddy grabs her by the arm, steadying her. He looks at the broken glass on the floor and then glares at me. Josephine Elizabeth Zara Cadigan. Through the open door, I see a kai diving from the hibiscus bushes, scrambling to get away before he's discovered. As usual, he trips over his two left feet, decides to stay on the ground, and crawls through the gate next door. How much times must I tell you not to throw balls in the house? Daddy slaps the side of the fridge in frustration. I gasp as the bucket rocks. Daddy glances up and manages to jump out of the way just before the bucket tips over. I guess it's my lucky day after all. All the contents, the fish guts, and the scales fall on top of Daddy's date. It looks like a brain has exploded on top of her head with one particularly long, fat piece of entrails sliding down her ear and plopping onto her bare shoulder like a vomit-colored earthworm. I can't help but gag at the smell of the fish intestines. A swarm of flies zips through the back door and dances above her head, eager to feast on the foul, rotting flesh. Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! She cries. With a trembling hand, she plucks a fish head from her bouncy hair. A long string of slime clings to her fingers. It reminds me of the gooey trail a slug leaves behind when trying to escape a salt ambush. This is too much. I just can't, she yells. Daddy's date yanks the hair off of her head, exposing cornrows covered by a tan stocking cap. She throws the curly brown wig on the ground and heads for the door. Debbie, wait! Daddy calls after her, but she ignores him. Goodbye, friend. Daddy turns around right in time to see the smug look on my face. Uh-oh. And that's the end of chapter one of Josephine Against the Sea by Shakira Bourne. Thanks so much for watching. See you next time.